Hi, good morning and welcome to the ZP Developer Zone. So we do this um, webinar every Thursday, excuse me, at 8 a.m. London time. And I will essentially just jump straight into it. Um, so let me um, start by saying we have the ZP Academy. There are a couple of free courses on that. And we will be expanding that briefly, or soon rather, I should say. Um, webinars, we do this webinar every Thursday. We do have collaborations, jobs, and we have the ZP Developers Zone. And we also have workshops. So we do have a raft of um, free services. Um, these workshops um, are, tend to be um, paid, but we do have a number of workshops um, running. So if you're interested in understanding electrochemistry and probably the more commercial aspects, we do have um, workshops and there's a lot of workshops um, being held this year. It's probably worth me saying that um, if you see a link in the videos, I will have put the vid the links already underneath um, the video on the YouTube channel. I would ask people to um, to like and to subscribe. It really it does help us to kind of see the feedback and to know that people are interested um, in the content that we are putting out um, at ZP. As you can see, we do do put a lot of effort into answering questions. So the first question we have today is how to make a non-enzymatic glucose strip. Um, I'll give a quick introduction to that. This is a follow-on from a question from last week. Um, so I will illustrate that. Um, ZP sensors suitable for um, sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, pH, um, and lithium for blood analysis. I'll give an example of where these kind of sensors are used, um, primarily in radiometer. It's probably worth saying that we do have potassium, sorry, sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, and pH. We don't have lithium, but we could develop that one. I really think of sort of no issue. We would do it as a small project. Um, the use of the easy flex in a Cottrell type equation. What this means is somebody has an easy flex. Their signal sounds like it's not steady state, but rather it's um, falling with a, as a function of time. And I'll just talk about how to interpret the signal from that. Um, this is a controversial question. ISE, ion selective electrodes versus ion selective field effect transistors. It's probably worth saying that I think both of these sensor types work. Um, if you have an electronics background or a semiconductor background or even a physics background, then you tend to do what's called ISFETs, ion selective field effect transistors. And if you have more of a chemistry background, you tend to do ion selective electrodes. So I don't think there is one, to be honest with you, that is better than the other. It's just preference and the way you're educated or trained. Um, getting started with garage chemistry. Um, I'll talk about that. Um, cost benefit analysis. This is, you know, it's an interesting question. It's actually quite a tough question is how to start a cost benefit analysis. So I'll give you some thoughts and um, an example of one of our products. But um, that's really quite a deep question, actually. Low cost kit for pH for starting with pH measurements. I will um, touch upon that. And um, I will also talk about the sense it's smart. Is the sense it's smart an analyzer or a potential stat is the way I've um, sort of phrased the question. It's a good question because the sense it's smart could be sort of underpowered for some um, applications, and I will um, touch upon that. First of all, question of what number one non enzymatic um, glucose strip. So last week we had some questions. Um, somebody's trying to develop a non enzymatic um, glucose strip for the detection of glucose. I had a look at their data and I put some slides out on it. I mean, it's probably worth saying that I thought, well, what you should be doing is taking a carbon um, screen printed electrode, functionalizing it with um, the metal oxide, if that's what you're using. And then actually the, um, the reason that most of the research is done in high pH is not because it's activating the metal oxide, but it's probably because, in fact, glucose, in order to oxidize glucose directly and not go the enzymatic route, they are essentially deprotonating the glucose using alkali and then the anion of glucose is easier to detect so that's where we got to last week with this question as you can see if you have questions we actually will do follow-up answers if you so wish um so what i'm suggesting is this look you need to take first of all you need to take a screen printed electrode you need to put your metal oxide onto that surface then you need to drop cast um I concentrate, you know, a, a um, alkali solution. So, um, for example, you need to drop cast down um, potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide, whichever one you're using. So it's on that electrode and it's dried on the surface. So let me go back a bit. So take the screen printed electrode, 
um, functionate it with a metal oxide if that's what you're doing on your um, glassy carbon electrode and then drop cast um, a hydroxide on there to sort of so because what I'm expecting then is that when the sample comes on it will dissolve the hydroxide and and essentially make the um, sample basic so you're essentially adding reagents to the sample when the sample comes on so let me back up and be very clear take a screen printed electrode put your metal oxide on there because that seems to be this catalytic surface that you think is necessary for the detection or oxidation of glucose because the glucose needs to be deprotonated the next thing you need to do is actually drop cast and dry down a hydroxide sodium or potassium hydroxide for example you have to do this quite carefully try and keep it you know on the electrode then when your sample comes on you're sort of doing drop testing the sample will dissolve your um, alkali become basic and then you can do your assay the thing is see that when you're developing if you're trying to make a glucose strip a glassy carbon electrode is not necessarily a good reflection of the final product it's nice for r and d but it's you know it's essentially the wrong structure because what i'm suggesting is that in fact rather than bringing the um, probe to the sample you bring the sample to the probe and that's the way a glucose strip works. You know, you don't stick glucose strips in blood. You bring blood to glucose strips. It's definitely the other way um, round. So that kind of setup where you have, um, you know, potential stat and then, you know, everything's in a glass, um, let's say, um, I want to say glass vessel like that with a glassy um, electrode in it. I think you need to change your, um, your setup so that you're actually bringing... Um, I was using screen printed electrodes because that's more reflective of what you're trying to do and then bring in drops of sample to the sensor and you're sort of testing in this configuration. That's much more, that's closer to blood testing on glucose strips than trying to do it in a um, glass vessel. Question number two, iron selective electrodes for blood electrolytes. So the question is, um, it's probably worth saying that we do have sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, pH and lithium. These type of um, solid state um, iron selective electrodes um, by the way I will put all links to these underneath the video these kind of electrodes are used in um, real products let's say so radiometer do use these um, not ours um, they for our manufacture their own um, they're multi-billion dollar business so um, they're manufacturing their own but what's useful to look at is when you look at the radiometer blood analyzer they actually have calibration solutions in there so that's in probably wash solutions and calibration solutions so that's an important point to see that um it's not enough to just get our electrodes you have to kind of unfortunately work with zp because the electrodes have to be used in the total system it's you know if the question is can our um, potassium sensor for example be used in whole blood the answer is yes that's what we developed it for um, and that's what it's used for. And you'll also notice that all the data on our websites, um, we're always testing the sensors in the clinical interesting range, especially on that sodium and potassium sensor. They're testing the clinically interesting range. But you do have to work with ZP because, um, you know, if you look at real products like the radiometer, then they're obviously, you know, they have a pump system and calibration solutions and wash solutions. And so the sensor has to work in the entire workflow. It's not just, does the sensor work? Yes, the sensor works, but you've got to, it's got to be integrated into an entire um, workflow. So working with ZP is either a micro project, mini project or proof of principle. The two links are there underneath the video. And um, and these are also all the links to the um, various um, iron selective electrodes that we do have. Um, and there again underneath the um, video. Question number three. Um, yeah, this is a tough one. OK, so. Um, what's happening here is the person has an easy flex and I think their signal they describe it as a Cottrell um, type response. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, they have an easy flex. Um, I suspect that the signal type that they have is um, sample goes on. So they have a signal. When the sample goes on, for example, the signal jumps up. But actually, it's not stable. It's falling with time. So they have signal versus time. And I put 500 seconds here because... Um, if we were doing a CGM sensor, continuous glucose monitoring sensor, we often find that our signal is not settled until about 500 seconds, which is you know, quite a long time out. Um, but what I'm describing here is that this is the easy flex signal versus time, and it's showing what we call a Cottrell response. So there's no signal until the sample goes on. The sample completes the circuit, the, sense, the signal jumps up, 
but it's actually not stable, it's falling with time. And that's the cultural response um, that the inquirer is um, referring to. Um, now I'm expecting them to add a new sample, but at a higher concentration and to have a sort of similar profile um, that the signal jumps up. But again, it's falling with time, but because it's at a higher concentration, the signal is higher. I'm sort of saying the easy flex, I want to say firmware and software is set up with the idea that signals are stable. Um, but if you've got a Cottrell type response, then I would almost say use the easy flex to gather data, but process the data. I don't want to say in a spreadsheet, but you know, cause I think the acquirer is more sophisticated than that. But what I would be doing is I would be choosing a time. Now choosing a time, um, you have to kind of choose that time quite um, prudently. Where do you think your strongest signal versus concentration is? So you choose a time and um, what you're doing then is you're looking at the signal at that time. And so for example, at the low concentration, I have a signal. At the high concentration, I have a signal. Now I know the concentrations here because um, you made up the solutions, let's say. So what I'm effect essentially showing you is Actually, what I'm doing then is a um, two point calibration at this point so that then if I test um, with an unknown sample, I get a concentration like that. What I'm I can, I can essentially use it as a lookup table signal um, come up to the uh, essentially to the slope and come across and look at what that concentration is. What I'm describing here is um, exactly how a lot of glucose meters on the market actually work that glucose meters on the market, you know, they Easy Flex is similar size to a glucose meter. If you look, it's even the same chipset, by the way. Um, a lot of glucose meters on the market, the chipset that we're using, they also use that. I don't necessarily recommend that chipset anymore, by the way, because um, Texas Instruments, I don't feel are supporting biosensors um, as well as other companies are. But Easy Flex has the same chipset as most glucose meters. And most glucose meters, you know, essentially the sample comes to the sensor. And actually the signal they get is a Cottrell type response. And what they're doing is they're choosing a time. Now they choose about five seconds. The reason they choose five seconds is because um, their assay is very soluble. So it solubilizes into the sample. And they want to, they don't want to do more than five seconds because a diabetic doesn't want to wait more than five seconds. So they've sort of, they're optimizing it both for, is my signal strong enough? And is the customer going to wait that long? So they've chosen five seconds. But that said, what they're doing then in the factory see is they're making a batch of electrodes and they're taking some of those, uh, uh, I should say, elect electrodes or sensors and calibrating them like, uh, like I'm just describing here. And once they've got their calibration then, then that's called a batch calibration. And that's what's then sort of happening in the real world. Then they, they used to take this batch calibration out with the product so that when the product was then used on an unknown sample, they would look at the signal, they would look at the calibration um, curve, and they would be able to reveal concentration. Now, glucose strips have gone what's called calibration free or code free, I think they call it. Um, but for years, this is what they were doing. To become calibration free, by the way, um, it's a big investment. I mean, you know, they, they took about 20 years to do that. So if you have a Cottrell type response, then I suggest that you essentially choose the time that's most indicative of the concentration. You create a concentration curve, essentially in a third party system. And then when you can look at your, your signal for an unknown sample at a certain time point, and then use the calibration curve to tell you what your concentration um, actually is. Question number four. This one I'm not gonna be able to give a very, um, I wanna say detailed answer in because I like the suggestion, you know, look at iron selective versus um, iron selective electrodes versus ISFETs or iron selective field effect transistors. The quick answer is we do actually do a lot of projects um, using ISFETs. We tend to have what's called a hybrid manufacturing approach. So what that means is that we're both doing um, CMOS type fabrication of um, field effect transistors, but we're also using um, thick film printing as well. So we're quite hybrid in our um, approach on that. In fact, I'll be doing a talk next week on um, gas sensors, and there you'll see that we're using a hybrid manufacturing technique. So the quick answer is, see, I don't think one is better than the other. Um, I know I said it already, but whether you use one versus the other, I think in 
um, it really depends on your training. If you have a chemistry background, you tend to use iron selective electrodes. And if you have a physics background, you tend to use um, iron selective field effect transistors. And same electronic guys prefer ISFET as well. So I'm not going to sit here and say that one is better than the other. I'm generally not. I would say that we do have quite a detailed video on this. One of our um, ZP developers own members called Ali um, made a video about this um, a long time ago. Um, and so I put a link to that um, here that will help you. The reason I'm not giving an opinion on it is because um, I just don't think one is better than the other. I think it's just preference. Um, what I do, what I, the problem I do have with ISFET a little bit is, or field effect transistors is, when you're working in the electrochemistry realm, you have all sorts of techniques, amperometry, voltammetry, potentiometry, impedance spectroscopy. You know, we could do it all on very small circuits. I feel that when people go for field effect transistors, they have what's called an IV curve, and that's it. They lose all the kind of um, subtleties and the vast range of techniques that we can use in electrochemistry to prize out signal. So I do feel that the use of transistors and field effect transistors um, is, um, how do I say this? Subtle. Is kind of losing some of the te some of the really clever techniques that we do actually have in electrochemistry. I mean, when you look at voltammetry alone, you know, there's cyclovoltammetry, square wave voltammetry, differential pulse voltammetry, normal pulse voltammetry. There's so many ways of um, gathering signal in electrochemistry that I think field effect transistors, people tend to just think of IV curves and um, lose all the great host of um, methodologies that are available in electrochemistry. So that would be why I prefer using electrochemical techniques, which ion selective electrodes kind of fall under as opposed to ISFETs. But we do fabricate ISFETs, um, and we tend to do it in not just the CMOS fabrication, but actually CMOS plus um, thick film printing um, as well. Question number five. Somebody wants to do some garage chemistry. Um, they want to just kind of start with some experiments. So uh, I think it's probably worth saying that before you dive too much into it, um, we do have these free courses on the um, ZP Academy. We do have a whole bunch of educational videos on the ZP website. I'm going to link to all of these, by the way. Um, and we also have the, a educational um, list on the YouTube channel as well. So all of these I will link to. So all these videos are, um, so all these um, links are definitely underneath the um, video on YouTube. I think if you're going to start with some garage chemistry, you probably need a potential stat. Um, Obviously, you know, this is one of ours, you know, I have to, you know, full disclaimer, this is one of our potential stats. You'll need a decent connector. This is the one of the biggest things that I find that people get poor data when they don't have a decent connector. So here's a connector. Um, I've deliberately put the seven millimeter SPE with the two millimeter banana plugs. I know that goes well between our um, either screen printer electrodes or our biosensors and the potential stat. Um, I would say, you know, just start with screen printed electrodes before you jump into biosensors. So there's some screen printed electrodes. Again, the link will be underneath. And here's some, um, I would say, a, a test solution of ferricyanide, which I would also um, recommend because that way then you can sort of do voltammetry, cyclic voltammetry, and you can do all the sort of practicing all the electrochemical techniques. So a potential stat, a connector, screen printed electrodes, and then a solution for actually testing. If you want to get more into biosensors, then I think the pH sensor is really the place to start. It's the most robust, lowest cost sensor we have, um, and which I've also got a link to, and also some pH solutions, because what happens is people start trying to test all sorts of bizarre, uh, no, not that bizarre, but um, they start making up um, kitchen brews of various pHs, like lemon juice and vinegar and all sorts of stuff, which is great, but it's not super control of scientific so um, we also have some test solutions as well um there is a lower cost option on the potential stat and i've also got a link to that whoops a daisy a link to that my only slight concern with the sense it's smart is actually covering question eight in a bit so i will cover it um, um in a bit but that is a low cost option so anything i've shown today the links are underneath the video so hopefully that will help you hone in on a set of um, materials that will be useful to you um, and then that can you know essentially you can sort of learn amperometry and voltammetry and potentiometry 
Now that potential stat I'm showing doesn't do impedance spectroscopy. There's an upgraded, there's a different model that does that um, for impedance spectroscopy. But I think it's, a, it's okay to start. Most of our sensors um, are either amperometric or potentiometric. Um, we do use impedance for the conductivity sensors though, I must say that. This is a tough question. Question number six, cost benefit analysis. So this person's a group of people who have developed an, uh, um, an absorbent material and they need to do a cost benefit analysis. So um, we do do these by the way. Um, well, I, well I'll, I'll, let me introduce it. So they want to do a, to, to start a cost benefit analysis, you kind of know, need to know your cost of the product, which actually was in a, which was, which was in the last week's um, webinar on Thursday last week, um, which, so we did actually do this. The cost of the bent of, of the product is often called the bomb, the builder material. So you need to know the cost of the product or the selling price of your product. You can't know that until you know the bomb, but you need to know what are you selling this product for? And then the benefit of the product. Now a benefit, a cost benefit analysis is, um, the benefit of the product kind of falls into cost saving. So I, often actually you know it, I, I really want to prove that our product can give a benefit just in the financial realm but I know that for medical products that are sort of sold into public health systems you need to sort of sometimes demonstrate things like productivity gains and also well-being um, these are kind of more intangibles um, whereas the cost saving is almost you know direct so if you um, make a better product and it's better and lower cost than the existing product, that's a very easy argument to, to make. But um, if you then make a product that's slightly more expensive than the incumbent product, then you have to start making these productivity gains and these well-being um, gains arguments. And that's, you know, that's a harder argument to do. A cost benefit analysis is actually quite close to a return on investment and ROI. So return on investment is quite, you know, common in business that, you know, you say to somebody, you know, if I give you, if I sell you this product, you'll get your return on investment in X amount of time. So let me do a return on investment case study for you. So ZP, you know, we make um, screen printed electrodes and we convert them into things like um, environmental sensors. This is an example where we converted it into a um, nitrate in soil system. So this is the product. You can see our screen printed electrodes there um, and you can see them in the product um, here. So um, how do I do my return on investment argument? So our nitrate sensor, um, for example, it can reduce global CO2 um, because a lot of global CO2 has actually come from nitrate production, but that's an almost indirect cost. Um, it can also um, reduce um, global energy production which is linked to CO2 production, by the way, but that's again, an indirect cost. My, let's say my customer is actually the farmer. So the farmer might be interested in these, but they don't give him a direct cost saving. Um, now this might get, make him more intrigued that 67% of nitrates are probably wasted. See, so I can make an argument now that, um, dear farmer, if you buy this product, you could reduce your nitrate fertilizer bill by two thirds. Now he's starting to become interested because that's a direct and tangible cost. Farmers are interested of obviously in pollution, you know, everyone wants a clean environment, but that's an, you know, that's a sort of a more of an intangible um, saving. And, you know, I, I find it harder to, you know, that that's an associated benefit. What the farmer may be more interested in is actually that direct cost reduction. Now what makes, but you have to, obviously to make a cost analysis, you have to have real numbers. So for example, in 2022, the cost of nitrates was 1400 euros per ton. Now our product we estimated would be about 700 euros to buy. So that means that if I only saved the farmer half a ton, the product would have paid for itself. So that's the return on investment argument. You know, it's very tangible. Nitrates cost you this much per ton. My product costs less than a, a, a ton of nitrate. If you save just one ton of nitrate, the products pay for itself. And then you get all the other benefits, but these are intang sort of slightly intangible benefits. But, you know, make the product feel, you know, yeah, everyone wants to reduce CO2 and 
and um, pollution. So you have to kind of say, my product costs this much and it will directly save you this much. The other intangibles are nice to haves, but business to business, people are very interested in direct costs and tangible costs. Business to public health system, then you can start potentially playing the more intangible um, costs. So it's a hard question. I haven't given you a great answer, but I've given you at least a case study of how we were able to demonstrate a return on investment. Question number seven, um, somebody's interested in measuring pH. I, I like the comment, um, low cost manacy, because low cost, there's always a cost in everything. And so if you're trying to do everything low cost, you're just shifting the cost somewhere else in some ways. But um, we, one of the lowest cost ways of um, electronics for doing pH measurement is actually our single purpose um, um, biosensor board. There's a link to it here. What I would say is if you can read and understand this data sheet, then you are qualified to use it. If you read and don't understand it or have further questions, then it probably says that you're not really, you know, the electronics team that you have is not, is, is not, um, can't really take on board that board. So there is a bit of a, if you're going to engage with ZP and you're going to engage in our single purpose biosensor circuit, you do need to read that data sheet. If you understand it, great. And if you don't, then um, the single purpose um, biosensor board is not um, for you. Because we do have technologies that are um, much easier to engage on. And this is our Sensi All platform, you know, which is much more sort of ready for, um, let's say, the consumer. Um, you know, it's all very beautiful. So we have very levels of products. But, you know, if the data sheets are not clear, then I, please don't engage with the product because, um, you know, but we do have um, the single purpose circuit. Um, you'll need that. You'll need the connector. The connector is a link to it here. You will need the pH sensors. Um, get those hyper value sensors. That's the link to it there. Um, get some calibration solutions as well because people just start jumping in with all sorts of pH solutions which they don't even know the pH of and then they sort of come back and say oh it's not working it's like um, what's the solution you're using it's some sort of homebrew cocktail so make sure that you also get those pH um, solutions as well any links are underneath the video um, as well question number eight it's a really good question um, so question number eight is around the sense it's smart sense it's smart is um, we sell it on our website. Um, I'll put a link to that. Um, they're interested in doing electropolymerization for making MIPS, molecular imprinted polymers. And they're wondering if the Sensit Smart is really powerful enough to do MIPS. Um, so I obviously would. The first thing is, I've heard directly from Palm Sense that actually they like our um, hyper value carbon electrodes. I've said it last week. I know that the inquiry already knows this. But because our hyper value carbon electrodes have a silver silver chloride counter electrode. It means that the um, the compliance voltage is much the, the compliance voltage requirement is much lower with our screen printed electrodes as opposed to others. So that actually means the palm the sense it's smart can act, can actually do its job. Um, now, so that's the sense it's smart. I there's I will put a link to that. So I just did a quick. Um, we do a lot of um, Pyrrol um, MIPS type electropolymerizations, just FYI. Um, I didn't bring up our own data. I just grabbed this from the um, literature. So I just had a quick look at it to kind of see what kind of voltages they were using in this um, paper. So I think that the Percentit Smart could do that working electrode voltage, but I know that the, the user's concern is about the compliance voltage. And the honest answer is we have not used the Sensit Smart to do electropolymerizations. I recognize the question, I think you stand a chance, but unless I've done it, I can't absolutely say is the answer. I honestly think you're actually, I feel like the sense it's smart is, an, is a really an, an analytical tool. And what you probably need is, is you know, is a, is a more powered potential stat. So you can do um, synthesis and analysis. It's not to degrade the part sense it's smart. I think it's a, you know, it's a great little tool, but I couldn't sit here and, and say that we have used it to do Electropolymerizations, and I'm not sure that we would use it because you know it wouldn't be like there would be soon be some application of electropolymerization or electro deposition where we did need more power. And so I think the sense it's smart is a nice tool for um, demonstrating the analysis side of the science, but it's not necessarily a great tool for doing the preparation of sensors or electrodes um, tool.
obviously again i'm biased you know but we have our anna pot um we also sell the sense it's smart um either way i would obviously course you know biased reckon i and um, recommend our hyper value electrodes um what i will now do is um summarize the question so to make that non-enzymatic glucose strip take a screen printed carbon electrode put the metal oxide onto that carbon electrode and then drop cast the base or the alkali material on top of that then your sample should dissolve the alkali material become um, alkaline or basic in its itself and then you'll be able to do your analysis um, we do we do have sodium potassium chloride calcium and ph but you do have to work with zp in order to use them and we can develop the lithium if you so um, wish i hope i've helped at least start answering that question on easy effects and control if the question is more complicated then come back and ask us again isc versus isfet i've actually we do have a video on isfet so hopefully that video will be useful to you getting started with garage chemistry i have listed out um, um a series of products i think will help you get started with garage chemistry cost benefit analysis um i'm sort of saying that if your cost is less than an incumbent product that's an easier argument to make um, and if you can demonstrate a direct cost saving, as we did in the nitrate sensor, then that's also an easier argument. But some of those intangibles like wellness and stuff, those are harder arguments to make. Um, low cost kit for pH. I Hopefully I have confirmed that you are looking at the right products. The only thing I've added there is make sure that you read that data sheet. And I would also recommend the calibration solutions. Otherwise, you're going to start with unknown pHs and think that the technology doesn't work when really you're just testing something that we've not even thought of um question number eight um i think the sense it's smart is really an analyzer it's not a you know full blown power potential that you know we don't use the sense it's smart to um functionalize electrodes nothing against it it's just i do you know i'm pretty sure it wouldn't take long before we were trying to do some sort of electro deposition that <laughs> required more power than it, it could actually give um so i just want to finish with a thank you a thank you um if you can like and subscribe, that'd be really great. But otherwise, um, have a good week. And um, as always, you know, send in the questions and um, we always make a sincere um, attempt at least answering them. Okay, take care and have a um, good week. Thank you very much.